Um, hello, everyone. How you guys doing? Been a good weekend? Um, well, thank you guys. I know you've had a, a really busy weekend and full of uh, inspiring things and information and all, a lot of things to take home to all your different campuses all over the world. Um, I want to thank Sam and the team at MCM first for um, getting in touch with me and basically harassing me into meeting him until once I finally did, I realized what a great guy he was and, and what he was working with and uh, decided to um, see if we could come and be a part of this and I'm really glad we came. We're just going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the, the trip that we just took and kind of some of the work that we do um, that's very similar to the work that you guys do. And then uh, Kanan's going to play some music. The boys are going to come out and play some music. We thought that would be a good way to send you guys off. So um, as you saw, we just had this, this, this trip to, to, to Somalia that we went on, what was that, three weeks ago? Yeah, about three weeks ago we went. Um, and it, you know, the interesting thing about that trip is, uh, you know, the, the situation happened that, that, that it, the crisis occurred, but Somalia is never far from, from my heart by proxy of being Kanan's friend and business partner for the last 10 years. So when, when the, the crisis came to the forefront, you know, everybody kind of turned to us and, and asked us, well, what are we going to do? What should we do? And, and they, they, they kind of were looking to us to, to do something. And um, the, the thing we realized was that, you know, there's, there's kind of fail-safe things you can do in the entertainment side of things. You can sell a song, you can do a benefit concert, you can sell a t-shirt. And all those, all those things seem, while the intention is worthwhile, the, the impact of them over time for us, have, we've started to see that it doesn't have the impact that you think. So what we decided to do was to take that trip. Um, and, and in taking that trip, we, we learned a lot. And we, we, you know, even for Kanan, the guy who's supposed to know everything about Africa, and specifically Somalia, um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, you know, his first time back, as you saw in the video. But the, the, what I'm getting at was that by going there and seeing the situation firsthand, we were able to have an experience that gives us a chance to, to um, speak from experience and speak from personal interactions that we had with people at that hospital and so on and so forth and be able to do something that's very personal for us. I say all that because I think the work that you guys do is very personal and that, that you've, you've made the choice to do what you're doing um, as students and on your campuses from a personal standpoint. So because you made that personal choice, I just encourage you to keep that personal connection and to, to work from that space and that passion space as opposed to kind of the other things that, that, um, that, that kind of get in the way of, of, of good intention. And, um, you know, we're just going to spend a few minutes. Uh, um, I'm going to think of a question. I don't know what I'm going to ask this guy because I ask him about 30 questions every day. Um, and let me think of something. Hmm. Um, actually, I think that... The, the, the six, you know, the, the day we spent on uh, the ground in Mogadishu was like very surreal for, for me. It was kind of this, this moment where we talked about going to Mogadishu for years and then we found ourselves there. Um, you know, you said something in the video that it was very, you never expected to return like that. What, was the, what, would, what had the, the, the biggest impact on you in, in uh, making that trip to, to Mogadishu and then to Dadaab and being in Somalia at this time? Um, well, first of all, it's good to be here, and um, the, I, I don't know, these days I've been a, a little bit in a hiding because, um, you know, things um, can become overwhelming as, uh, you know, we are, we are people who want to do things, but f first and foremost, we're human beings and we get affected um, by the general kind of um, lax way that the world handles uh, some of the more, more urgent situations. Um, we've been having conversations with uh, some of these people that have a tremendous amount of power or wealth, economic wealth, to change uh, some dire situations. And oftentimes, uh, the bureaucracy of economy itself is a lot to get through, you know. Um, so we've been kind of uh, 
having these meetings, and I personally have been getting slightly disheartened by what I'm learning. Um, it's strange because I felt like going to going to Somalia and, and Mogadishu. This is considered one of the more probably the most dangerous place in the world, and the conditions are, are, are very difficult at the moment. I came back from there quite inspired, and I was given hope by people who live in these circumstances. Then I came here and sat down with a couple of billionaires, and I felt quite uninspired. I felt deflated, you know. And so it's a very, very strange uh, situation. Um, but I guess what uh, I to answer your question, the thing that moved me uh, the most about being there was um, I was I was witnessing a people who are not aware of who do not have a sense of their own defeat, um, which is kind of remarkable to to be among a people who. Uh, you know, if if it was a game, they don't know when the game is over. Uh, they don't know that they've lost. They don't even know if they have less points than you do. They're just they're just at life, you know. And and they they more than anything they invite you to live, and uh, they ask you how you're doing and have you eaten and. Uh, you know, are you well? How are you holding up with this situation? And I'm like, you're in this situation, you know. I'm, <laughs> I'm visiting and, and I'm kind of being consoled, you know. I felt, I felt like that's a tremendous quality. It's a very human quality. And here, we tend to forget that that's something that's in us, perseverance. Adaptation and, and all of that is something that's within. Um, we think it's reserved for the for the privileged, but it really it really isn't. Um, it's something that comes from living alongside with loss, and and knowing that loss is a part of life. And so, for me, it was witnessing these people who have have. Uh, have not lost at all, you know, in, in, in the way that they recognize loss to be a part of life. And uh, it was, it was, uh, that was inspiring for me. I mean, I think that <clears throat> I know all you guys have, are here and you get to go back to, uh, to your campuses and you all have uh, certain things that you guys have, have, again, I was saying earlier, made a choice to, to uh, be involved in and, and add on to the task of already being a student and already all the pressures of day-to-day -day life and, and really kind of celebrate that, that, that choice. And I, and I think that um, when I first started talking to Sam, I actually became, I think, a little annoying to him because he'd call me up and he'd be like, hey man, we're doing this and we're doing that. And, and I just kind of would sound like this broken record because I just, I just say, well, well, you know, what about how do we rethink the, the idea of what it means to kind of be in this space of giving, not from the, from the um, intention standpoint, but from the execution standpoint? And, and to add on to what Kanon is saying, even for us, you know, we, we found ourselves, we now have access to, to so many people and, and, and to media and all these things, and people are asking us, you know, what to do, or they're offering their help. And um, we made a promise to each other that, that we'd, if we were going to enter into this space more and, and kind of take steps further outside of what we do normally, which is, you know, make music or create TV and film, like our creative space, if we're going to step out of that or out of our regular business space, that we were pulling up to do this event the other day, and we, we realized that, that as long as we kept our in independence and if we, we kept our ability to change our mind, which I guess are one and the same, but to, to switch lanes at all times. And, even in the few weeks of coming back from Somalia, we've had to rethink probably on a daily basis what we want to do as it relates to the commitments we made to the people at the hospital there, as it relates to the media, as it relates to do we start a foundation, do we not? And I, I'm telling you all this because it's difficult what you guys are, the task you guys are taking on. It's not easy to move through it, but if you can really rethink it and kind of think about the things that people aren't doing, 
that are, are, are we need to get more reconnected to the place of your where you're inspired from to give because um, I'm, I'm amazed at the disconnection of of uh, of people's from people's the world's intentions to what you can find around the world and it's not just Somalia there's you know there's issues right here in Boston or probably on this campus in Harvard that people need to pay closer attention to so I share that because I kept saying to Sam, like, well, what are you doing to rethink this thing? Well, what are you doing to rethink this thing? And he always had a good answer, but I'm sure he was a little annoyed at my broken record conversation. Uh, it was okay? <laughs> now it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, listen, the, the, the truth about it is, is I, when I came here, the reason why so I was even posing a question at all is because I wasn't, I wasn't interested in making a speech to anyone. Um, because I, I, I realized uh, that it, it, making, um, making speeches to people and, and uh, being convicted in that which is the truth about anything is very much like fashion, you know, you, you, you kind of, you often look back at your old photos and you laugh, you know. And I, I don't, you know, I don't want to be in that position, you know. We want to always be able to adapt, and uh, and be able to change our minds about how how the approach the world is changing. So there can't be one model in the way to fix some of the issues of the world. Um, and so we, we are more interested in learning. Uh, from you guys through your questions or uh, you know through your ideas and uh, I think you're at the best stage uh, in in which something can be changed in that you may not know what is the uh, uh, you may not know all the kind of um, obstacles ahead I think that's perfect uh, I think that's the best way to approach a problem it's with a why not you know why can't we why can't we change that why can't we do something about that there's a there's a there's a young uh comedian this girl who has uh i think she's like strictly a twitter comedian which is kind of amazing this is like a new job but she 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 writes these really funny things on twitter i think it's her, her name is um Shelly Farrow or Fear or something like this. Shelby Farrow, maybe. And she, she wrote uh, some time ago something that made me laugh. And she, she said on Twitter, um, uh, world hunger, question mark, um, uh, uh, solution, food, done, next problem. <laughs> Uh, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's probably really what it takes. And so, you know, I think that that kind of naivety, that kind of like, what, why not? We have a lot of food here. Uh, why can't we change things? I think it's, it comes from you. And, and so if, if you guys, um, I think it would be nice to uh, engage you guys in a conversation and to, to tell us one or two things about, you know, whatever you think is, is, is right. And uh, we'll, we'll see what we can learn from each other. This is the fishbowl where you guys just stare in and we stare out. <laughs> and we wonder who's brave. <clears throat> right here, nice and close. This is, more about your this is uh, just more of a question about your trip to Somalia. I guess I was just kind of curious about um, maybe how you, what, what kind of process was there to get into the country and like, what, like security, that kind of thing. I know it's a very probably difficult country to get into as it's in you know, such dire situation right now. So mm -hmm. if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, it was very, it was very, um, uh, so you want to speak to that? It was a lot yeah. of like, it was a lot of like commando situation. It, yeah, it, it felt was, like I was on, so, on like in a Bruce Willis Die Hard movie or something. <clears throat> I was hearing things that I didn't want to hear, um, it, you know, I, and I kept thinking, and then, you know, when I got the, the budget for the security, you know, my, my businessman instinct was to negotiate the, 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 the price. And then I thought, no, I probably should negotiate with the security guy. 
as uh, how much can I give you a tip? Can I give you more money? Um, but it was, uh, I think what we had to do was, um, was we had to be just very mindful of, of really of Canaan's situation there because, I mean, the outpouring of love and support on the ground from little kids to grandmothers who, who know him and, and, and um, love the, 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 what it, the work he's been doing was amazing. But the situation there is, is so far on the edge that anything could happen anytime. So we couldn't take any, any chances and we just, we did what we could. We, we talked, you know, we hired the right people who were working on the ground there. We hired people over here who are experts, but it really did, it was really a military operation to go in there and to be secure. Not a lot of people are going in and out of Mogadishu. But the thing that's important to recognize within that is that it's a functioning country and, when you, and a functioning country for the last 20 years. So there is people, you know, there's, you, if you think that nothing's happening there, you would think, well, then why are there stores that are still open? Yeah, not everybody can afford to go into them or, or, or vehicles or these type of things or commercial flights coming in and out. And, you know, Somalia right now has the largest, it, of all the economies in the world, although they don't have a central government, they have the largest percentage of remittance back into the country. Uh, I think it's 70% of the, the, of the economy is, comes from the diaspora. There's 9 million Somalis in the world and 8 million uh, in the diaspora and 8 million in Somalia. So while this crisis is, is happening, you know, Somalia has been helping itself by virtue of no other choice for 20 years. There's all this other stuff that happens, but people are living there. So it was interesting to understand that that situation, you know, compounded by the, you know, the, the people living in IDP camps and all this other stuff. But um, yeah, it was, it was um, not like anything I'd ever really organized or before. It was pretty surreal. Are you gonna give him the mic? I think, um, I think I speak for most people in this room when we, we really empathize and want to do something. A lot of us work in Africa, and I myself went to Dadaab, the refugee camp, um, spent some time there. And so, of all of us in this room, I think we represent millions and millions of young people around the world, and we will do something now if we have a direction, because a lot of us, you know, are of that conviction that most people, when given the opportunity, will respond and do good if they have that choice. So what is the option as of right now, this hour, that we could start doing to help? What, what, what is the most effective? Is it, you know, nets in that hospital? Is it, I know it's overwhelming, but what is the thing that we can take right now and just spread it to the millions of people who we um, talk to? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a, that's a, I, I, I wanna I wanna acknowledge that as a as a um, um, kind of a, a, a beautiful question in that it comes from uh, the urge to uh, be of assistance of use to to people to humanity. Um, I think a lot of people do feel that way. The the real the real tricky uh, uh, situation we we've come across is. How do you do that? Not, not what do you do, it, it, but how do you do what you do? Um, in, in what state are you when you're doing it? My, my real apprehension to people coming to the rescue of other people is that they often tend to take, and I'm, you know, I want you to take what I'm saying because it comes from a good place, it, people who are wanting to be of assistance to other human beings often take to take the position of uh, a, a higher uh, uh, place than that than the person that they are of assistance to, and so what we found is that people are willing to be helpful, a very uh, but they're not willing to question who they are while helping. Um, and so, you know, I would say the very f uh, f uh, first thing is not to uh, put money into some UNICEF or something, or, or, or do, do something uh, courageous and say, I'm gonna go and bring these kids food or something. I think people want to know that while you're doing this, that you, uh, 
um, that you recognize y you see yourself and you see the people that you're helping as equals. Um, Africa has suffered for a very long time of the inequality of the philanthropist concept. They, they, that the, often philanthropists feel of Africa as this helpless uh, the child that they want to nestle into their breasts and save. Um, Africa doesn't feel that way about itself. And so one, uh, it could take a day, it could take you 10 years, but a real question to answer uh, from yourself is, when I'm helping people, do I recognize their infinite potential? Do I see them as equals? Uh, you know, am I, of, am I of assistance, not really of help? Um, when, you, when you can answer that question positively, then th there are many ways to do this. I mean, in, in Somalia, we are um, directly in, in touch with this hospital that we visited. The hospital supports, um, you know, uh, uh, the largest percent of the malnutrition children. It's the only hospital that serves malnutrition children for eight million people. And so it's incredibly overwhelmed. And so when we went there, we had conversations with the, with the patients, we had conversations with the nurses and the doctors and the head of the hospital. And the thing that we found uh, more than anything else was a sense of dignity that needed to be preserved. Uh, that these people did not see, uh, did not uh, hold out hands like this to the world and say, help me. Instead, they said, you know, we are doing this about our own problems. Uh, all, the vol all the doctors are volunteers. All the nurses are volunteers. Um, the, the, the ambulance service is run by a volunteer company. All Somali. And, and what they're saying is, yes, we would like the assistance of the world. Yes, we would like for people to come and, and, and as our brothers and our sisters to be of use to but we're very caught. I hope this is not the mic I'm using to perform. Um, but we're very cautious in um, the way that we are seen. Uh, the, there's a certain legacy famines leave behind. There's a stain in the, in the pride of the people that it, it leaves. And so, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't just buy nets, don't just donate money, learn something about the place, um, or learn something about yourself and why you're doing what you're doing, and do, and do it then, do it good. Uh, don't just do it, you know. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, what I would say. We have a jogger. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Golaho Olubowale, originally from Nigeria, West Africa, Africa. So I know we are Somalis, and I'm very conversant with uh, the Somalian issue. Uh, my question is this. There's something driving crisis all over Africa, more or less the power or leadership structure. We have leaders all over Africa, mostly, who have configured the institution of state to serve their personal family purpose, instead of serving the generality of the people. And this ultimately leads to a crisis. Somalia is an example. We had in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Libya, virtually everywhere. What can we do as individuals, as groups, to network, to use our resources, our talents, to prevent 
the crisis from even occurring. We don't need to wait until there is a state failure before we start, um, you know, emergency food donation or whatever. How can we reconfigure the leadership and the power structure in Africa and elsewhere to begin to serve the people and not the allies? Thank you. Chief. Information about me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, th that's a great question, but the the, the the, I wanna I wanna talk a little bit about where that uh, question arises from because the it's a very large um, idea that we have about African governance. It's a very large, um, often mythical concept we have about African. Governance. I don't think it's. To, I don't think it's true to say corruption is everywhere in Africa. Um, I think they're very well-intentioned, very uh, strong, uh, capable leaders that are in Africa. Um, we just find a way to bulk them together in uh, this uh, Western myth of African irresponsibility which has happened for a very, very long time. We've wanted to, uh, first of all, in the West, we're very much a part of um, uh, Africa's uh, leadership corruption. And then we, we blanket them and say, well, that's what they must all be. I don't think that's true for Rwanda. Um, I don't think it's true for, for a lot of the continent that is, that is being progressive. Also, I don't think it's inherent and intrinsic to the quality of African people, because how could it be, this is what we will think, how could it be that the leadership, people in leadership are corrupt if there is not an intrinsic corruption within African people? Uh, because we know that we choose our best or something. We vote for our, our leaders and we put them in a pedestal and say, these are our leaders. So if they constantly come up corrupt, who are the people? And so um, I think we have to recognize politics the same way we recognize politics here in the, in the United States. We're not always satisfied with the people we, we choose as our, our leaders. They, they, they could be the most handsome of us, they could be the most articulate of us, and they could, be, they could have the most uh, well-backed and organized system. And, and then we, we, we say these are our leaders, but we, we don't, we, we're not always behind their decisions. So I, I want to recognize Africa in the same way that we recognize the political system here. Um, it's not an intrinsic corruption. Also, Africa is, is being, uh, is very progressive in its entrepreneurial side. Um, you have now the, lar uh, the most, uh, uh, the most new, uh, millionaires entered into this whatever millionaire databases they have we've learned about our Africans uh, and they've they're young people who are innovating Africa um, it is uh, it is a very very wealthy continent that is getting poorer so th there's a there's an systematic uh, uh, political uh, global economical uh, kind of uh, inconsistency with Africa in it, it itself. And, and that's true. And of course, we as African people have uh, to shoulder quite a bit of that responsibility and we know that. Uh, but I don't think it's true to say we're in, uh, intrinsically corrupt or that all of our leaders are corrupt. They're very, uh, we, example, Somalia has not had a central government at all for 20 years. And still, uh, they're ahead in a lot, of, a lot of industries. So that says more about the positive characteristics of the people than it does of, of the negative, because they're working under really tough and incredible circumstances my my main thing is that uh, we just have to recognize uh, 
context where it's required for people. Uh, and, and nothing is more powerful than the human context of complexity, of contradiction, of, um, of, of, uh, of, 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 of good and of negative. All of it exists within other people. Nobody is just great. Nobody is just uh, uh, in, uh, corrupt. Uh, nobody's just beautiful and nobody's just ugly and that's that's for us the same thing w when you look at africa it's not just it's not helpless it's everything that you are and and if you are going and setting off on this incredible uh, remarkable journey of being of use to yourself and to others recognize why you're doing it and when you do recognize those you're doing it for are not you, you you're not like you you're not picking up babies you're not you know you're not <laughs> you're not mother teresa you're not like um saving anything you're just doing your part uh to be of use t to the world and that's very important work <laughs>